The title of my message today is, The Word Became Flesh. I'm going to read from John chapter 1, the first 18 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made him. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The world, the Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father. The Word became flesh. As we look at this and this great claim of Christianity, I want to talk this morning about understanding Islam today. And my emphasis is on understanding. We know that Christianity is still the largest religion in the world, and now Islam is the second largest. Amazingly, on a grassroots level, both Islam and Christianity remain largely ignorant or misunderstanding of each other. Most Americans today know almost nothing substantive about everyday Islam, and often what we think we know has been shaped often by the media more by caricature than by real facts. A few years ago I decided I was going to study Islam and develop my understanding and use first-hand sources. Today I want to give understanding and direction to believers and not store up stir up a hornet's nest. The first thing I did was buy and read the most widely used English Quran today. I just went online and googled which English version of the Quran sells the most. Uh, and that was the one I would read. It turned out to be a more radical version and I wanted to read every inch of it, the notes and the interpretations. This is the one that by the translation by Khan and al Eli, and it had interpretive notes and multiple indices. By the way, do you know which English translation is the most widely read today? That if I was a Muslim, I would Google it. Um, do you know what that is? 
It happens to be the King James Version is still bought and read at 55% of the market share. After that will be the New International Version at 18%, and the remaining 26% is spread over five more recent translations than the NIV, which actually was completed in 1978. It's not exactly new anymore. I next prayed about it, went to different bookstores, and read the book, Understanding the Quran. The author is Mateen Ilas, who was raised in Saudi Arabia as a Muslim in a Muslim home. Then he moved to America and got his doctorate at Stanford University and became a Christian pastor in the Midwest. And he writes from a culturally informed, and I believe a truly insightful perspective. He's not simplistic or caustic, but writes to give a full understanding of what is similar and what is vastly different between these two great world faiths. Finally, I went to the mosque in Lancaster and spent time with their imam. And it was actually in an alley down in the southern part of the city, and I had to go numerous times and build a relationship when we could talk honestly back and forth. This was a very simple mosque, and, a, and it was also a conservative mosque that would use the study Bible that I chose on the criteria. What's the, mo the one most studied? Because I wanted something relevant. I could have gone to one of the more liberal or progressive mosques, more towards Harrisburg, but I wanted something to know what people were reading as they joined in that faith. I spent time first listening and then sharing questions. Because I know the process you and I use to learn will determine what we learn. So I wanted to grab the Bible, it would be like a modern Muslim grabbing the NIV study Bible. And, and there's some in this church that's very commonly read and reading that as opposed to many other versions of the Bible. Most persons have noticed the rapid increase of Islam in America. And I did some research and what were the reasons for a religion like this growing in a predominantly Christian nation with such deep Christian roots. First is the issue of migration from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And by the way, if you hear nothing else, migration will be the great Christian and theological issue of the rest of our lives. And that's migrations of many cultures because as, the, as certain areas of the world slip deeper into poverty and hopelessness, whole cultures start to rise up and try to move elsewhere. So the first, the first reason is um, Muslims are migrating for the American dream. The second is uh, in their worldview. They are having more children and larger families than most other Americans. And third, Islam in America is growing due to many conversions from Christianity to Islam. And this is where I want to give some understanding as to what does this mean. In America, the reasons for these higher levels of conversion is, number one, the deep spiritual vacuum of American culture, and none of us can deny this, began, began as, as a, an overtly uh, Christian nation with Christian ideals, and slowly things have slipped away. Churches, many churches and denominations, have lost their deep Christian moorings, and they have lost their influence 
on American culture. And as Christian denominations are dividing over what were traditional moral absolutes and floundering now over vague ethics, ethics of tolerance and what is right and wrong, Islam, Islam has stormed into the American culture with a clear and self-confident and unapologetic worldview. It comes with a new Bible and with a clarity of a few simple things to do to make your journey to God. To many persons feeling jaded by the Christian churches around them in a post-Christian culture, Islam without apology makes serious demands on its followers like Christianity did a hundred years ago. So those who join Islam today will experience a massive lifestyle shift. Ultimate allegiance is demanded. Islam is unapologetically clear as to the do's and don'ts of your everyday life. And believe it or not, this has a quiet appeal for many persons lost in our post modern and ethically relative culture. They're so sick and tired of living in a sea of gray morals and being ethically just adrift to do whatever they want. Islam is providing a place to which you can anchor your life. And the believer of Islam is not required to understand how all the commands even fit together or make sense into some kind of worldview. They just have to obey the few simple points of Sharia law as interpreted by their local imam. In the past 50 years, Islam has recaptured the vision of conquering the world that was halted at the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1924. So there was like about a 24, 25 to 30 year era in which Islam was halted. After that, it has, it has uh, just raced back onto the world scene. Today, with a renewed vision, Muslims are now spreading their belief with a deep conviction that is rarely matched by American Christians who are largely sciences silenced by our culture and our media, and often buffoon. Why does Islam have an increasing appeal to African Americans? The reasons are complex, but we know this. The American church in general has mostly failed to communicate through their actions that the gospel is good news for all cultures. You have heard the saying, that the worship hour on Sunday morning is often the most segregated hour of our week. Another reason is that African Americans, in search for their identity, have looked back to their American roots and have been told that since Islam was the religion of their ancestors, it should be theirs today. The truth is, African Americans' ancestors uh, were, were a mix. There was some Muslim influence, there was also Christian influence, and tribal influences as well. But a new connection helps all of us to form a new identity. This has an even greater impact on those in prison, where your loyalty to your own race is necessary for survival as all groups are separated and survive in that way. Now the big question today for our culture in general is what about Muslim extremism? What about holy war? What about jihad? The first two centuries of Islam were highly militaristic. But moderate Muslims today would say that Islam is peaceful. 
the extremists do exist, but they say it's no more fair to judge them by the political aberrations or religious extremists than it would be to view all of Christianity by the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, or the Puritan witch hunts. But right here, with Jihad, is where the cultures of our world are colliding. And I remind us in conclusion, it is always the extremes that will drive our wars. For Christians, God calls us to a transforming love relationship with himself. All of this taking place through the leading and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in Islam, God is much more remote and, and apart from the believer. God is personally inaccessible. Little is said in the Quran of God's love. And love for God is shown as veneration and submitting to God. And that's where you get the word actually Islam in the first place, to submit. Nowhere in the Quran does God act out of warm love or out of a direct personal love for those whom he affects or elects in life. Because in their worldview, this would appear as a divine weakness. We need to understand these things in our ever-changing world. For Muslims, the primary currency of God is his sovereign power. For Christians, it is his sacrificial love. Islam says, bow before Allah. Christianity says, run to the loving arms of the Father. Remember, these two great world religions are superficially similar, but fundamentally opposite ways of faith and life. Actually, in the Quran, Jesus of Nazareth lived and went to the cross, but he never died, nor does he save, redeem, or, or of course, rise again. There is this vast difference in our faith and approaches. What are we to do in a world where that now the world looks differently on Christendom and often very scornfully? We must live like Jesus in this broken and confused world. Jesus is irrefutable and he is irresistible. We, in a positive way, must cling to Jesus. And I want to read our text one more time. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but our grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, it is an honor to take your name. And we thank you for your love poured into our lives. We thank you for your power that rose from the dead, that atones for our sins, that gives us your spirit. Jesus, you are our Savior, and we love and praise and worship you. And we pray for strength this week to live in gracious and winsome ways that the world may see you living in each of us. In your name we pray. Amen.